<laughs> That's how I intro this podcast. <laughs> hey you and welcome. Um, my name is Mike and um, you know what? I'm here with Keith sitting in the, our podcast, our amazing podcast recording studio. You know, just a couple of fellas chilling out. And today, what are we talking about? I'm pointing at Keith right now. We're talking about something spooky. We did say at the end of the last one, that Mad Trapper uh, episode, that we were going to do a we weird did. or paranormal one. You know, yeah. I mean, hey, it's spooky season. Yeah, That me. is true. I've already started. I've yeah. started putting up, putting up my uh, old Halloween decorations. Yeah. It's never too early. No, no, I have them up all year round. Literally yeah, all over true. my house, I have Halloween pumpkins and shit. Because it's just, you know what? It's as cool as fuck. Is, and I yeah. really don't, uh, you know, don't want to hear otherwise. I like the decor. Thank, yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah, yeah. Black and orange are my colors. Um, so, yeah. So, today, folks, we're talking about Ouija boards. Keith, mm-hmm. have you ever used a Ouija board? Uh, I have not. And, you know, I was thinking about using it. And mm-hmm. then I researched this case. And, um, <laughs> you thought I'm, again. Yeah, I'm kind of bit put off about, a uh, bit put off by it now. I'm not sure if I'm uh, interested in using it anymore. Yeah. Uh, I don't even know. To be honest, like... If I was to use it, though, I wouldn't even know what to ask. Like, what would what what would you ask the Ouija board? If you were to um, use it? How big is your dick? Probably first. You question. should probably know yeah, that. Yeah. Are your tits big? Yeah. <laughs> um, Look down. No, I don't know. See, I I don't think I would use one. Not because I believe that they're like real. Yeah. I don't. I think it's bullshit. But I think it's one of those things of like I would freak myself out. I know what you mean. Using yeah. it, like my I I know I would use it, and then I would start hearing like yeah. You know, in in yeah. the house, Whispers. I would start. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It would just be like normal shit, like the house settling. Yeah. But I know I would just creep myself out. Yes, to the yeah. point where I would just have like a nervous breakdown. You yeah. know, just I just get so paranoid. Yeah, yeah. And think everything's a ghost or a demon or something. So, uh, yeah, no, better or better not. Yeah. There's a couple of rules I know with the Ouija board. Mm-hmm. I, I think one of them is like you shouldn't ask when you're going to die. Which well, you think? I don't want to know. I don't want to know either. I think it's a good rule. But yeah, I feel a, go- a better question would be what what were my final words. Because yeah. that doesn't give you, like, it doesn't tell you when you're going to die, but it gives you a bit more context. For example, yeah. it'd be like... Full. It just stays on the U. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Or it's like, I'm going to swallow this whole burrito whole. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to stay away from burritos. Yeah. <laughs> there are no sharks in this world. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I'd rather just not know. You know, if it started giving me guff, I would just be, fuck you, buddy. Yeah. I would just... I'm not having not it. having it. If yeah. you even tried to talk to me, I'd be like, talk to the hands. Right? <laughs> that's, that's all. That's what I'd say to you. But in this uh, this episode of the That Chapter podcast, we're going to be telling uh, the history of the Ouija board, uh, you know, its place in modern cultures, especially American culture, because it's already that big in Europe, I suppose, is it? Or is it? Well, we had other things. Like, there was, it kind of, I feel a lot of it started in Europe with mm. the talking board. Well, this is a talking board, but, you know, the, the table turning? Yeah, 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 which we'll talk about. Just the mediumship and seances. Mm. That was very popular in England. But then, it was, this it was around the time when a lot of people from England were moving over to America. Yes, well. they brought all that shit with them. They brought a lot over. And then, but the Ouija, there's one other thing. So, I've oh. seen things, there's Ouija and Ouija. Okay. And I'm sure there's going to be people like, it's pronounced Ouija. I'm but I've looked it up. Both are acceptable. Uh, I will be saying Ouija. Okay. Uh, I think what I'll do is what I've done this entire time and not give a shit. <laughs> it's pronounced, and I was going to pronounce it my way. <laughs> the problem solved. I'm going to do, do me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The problem solved by me just not caring. <laughs> So yeah, so we're going to talk about the history of it, uh, its place and culture, and then talk about a few spooky ass tales, mm. tales of. Ouija's leading to Mia de or, Mia de. or uh, some spooky uh, experiences some people have had. Real ones as well, like mm. documented Oh, stuff. I hey, listen, we only deal with the facts yeah. on that chapter. Hard, cold Hard, facts. Hard, cold facts. Yeah. Absolutely. That's, that's, that's my motto. Always has been. I say it in every episode. Hard, <laughs> cold facts. Just like my hard, cold sometimes. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, so I think we should just stop. Oh, before I actually get into it, I do want to yeah. say this one thing. Okay. Uh, somebody emailed me on Patreon, mm-hmm. on the That Chapter Patreon for all you fans out there. Mm-hmm. Um, they, they had a great suggestion of doing uh, listener tales on the oh, podcast. Oh, yes. That would be good. So I think that would be so cool. So um, they said they, were, they asked us if something we'd ever consider doing. And I said, that sounds fascinating. So they said mm-hmm. they'd email me in a story. Um, Andy, for any other folks out there who have some crazy tales, be it spooky, mysterious, murdery, whatever, strange encounters, who knows? Yeah. I mean, you tell me. You tell me your story. Who might tell you what kind of story to tell me? Yeah. But if you have any good uh, stories to tell, we should do a listener tales episode. Yeah, that sounds uh, I think they're really cool. So yeah. yeah, we can tell your story and, you know, talk about it and make fun of you and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> As I said. <laughs> Roast you. Yeah, exactly. Uh, all right. Let's do it. Let's do it. Yes, exactly. I was pointing at Keith for something else, but I think that's acceptable. This is a Keith episode. He did all the heavy lifting on this episode, so fair fair play to you when it comes to the research. But um, I see you just here. A quick shout out to Robert Merch. 
There you go. Yeah. The world's now, foremost. Now I know what you're pointing to. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, who is apparently, according to Keith, I'm reading his words, the world's foremost collector, historian, and expert on Ouija and talking boards. Uh, much of my own. I'm my own. I'm in Keith's. <laughs> Research on the history of Ouija. Ouija was only possible due to his work. So thanks, Bob. Appreciate it. Yeah. All right. So let's uh, give it a go. Although some individuals believe the Ouija board to be a recent creation, similar devices have been utilized for thousands of years to help assist in decision-making, combating uh, illnesses, receiving divine guidance, and communicating with deceased loved ones, or even predicting the future. Did you know the very first Ouija board was slitting a goat's throat and bathing in its blood? Really? No, I'm just making oh, okay. it up. But no, I think that's what the Greeks did. They I, did. They would like sacrifice goats and shit before. Yeah, like, that's uh, so hardcore. So, yeah, I know. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's kind of like... <laughs> Missed same, that in my research. Yeah, same, same shit. In fact, dating back to 540 BC, a contraption similar to how the Ouija board works was employed by the philosopher Pythagoras. Historical records of his life indicate that his followers conducted seances using a wheeled table that moved towards symbols. Perhaps Pythagoras received his famous theorem from El Diablo himself. Mm. Sure felt that way in school. It did indeed. Mm. Do you remember the old uh, Pythagoras No, theory? I fucking don't. I use it every day. I don't even know what it is. No. I do remember uh, the name. Mm. Is it the triangle one? I don't know. I, yeah. Is it something like AB equals... No. A squared equals B squared plus C squared or Didn't I, that's something. Einstein. Is that not Einstein? Is it? Uh, I don't know. No, so, I'm pretty sure it's a, it's a shape. No, that Einstein is Guys, e, you were e. listening to us being as <laughs> stupid as fuck. <laughs> cut this, cut this. Cut this, yeah, yeah. Uh, just ignore what you just heard and pretend we know exactly what Pythagoras theorem is. Wow, you guys are really stupid. So around 1100 AD in China, there are references to automatic writing. Automatic writing is a psychic skill that allows an individual to create written content with a deliberate composition, which is like ChatGPT only. Yeah. Or predictive text. Yeah, yeah. predictive text. Yeah. There you go. Those who partake in automatic writing, they hold uh, a pencil or whatever they used back then. And then essentially they just like, I think they close their eyes and then they, the spirits, Jesus take my hand, Jesus take the wheel yeah. kind of moment. And there, then, was, there was a lot of showmanship to it, especially yeah. in, within, within seances, they used to like have, I'd say like they'd blindfolds on or bags over their yeah. heads or they'd be, I think there was someone as well where they went into like a box mm. with tied, tied up and they had like a, a board with chalk in it and then like the chalk would write. And oh. would yeah. A lot of showmanship. Was yeah, yeah. It sounds like a real yeah. Houdini shit. Yeah, yeah. That's kind of cool. Uh, in the 1850s, people started using a planchette. A planchette is a typically a heart-shaped flat wooden piece fitted with wheels and then a hole for your pencil. So the thing that's on top of the Ouija board, hmm. but with a pencil on it. Just basically. a smaller hole. Yeah, yeah smaller hole with a pencil. Oh, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, and that was used to aid automatic writing. Then in England, during the year 1853, table turning gained popularity as an entertaining pastime that swept across the nation. With table turning, participants sat around a table placed their hands on it and waited for rotations. The table itself would be would move as means of communicating with the spirits. The alphabet would be spoken slowly aloud and the table would tilt at the appropriate letter, the spelling it words and sentences. Like table turning, there were lots of other alphabet pointing devices used in the spiritual world, including uh, just laying out alphabet cards and asking the spirit to make a knock as you pointed towards different letters. So very tedious. Go, yeah, you'd have to go through the whole alphabet. Exactly, yeah. A, yeah. B, C, D. Is that C or D? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Which one is it? Yeah. <laughs> a, B, C. Yeah. Imagine getting when you get the Z. Telling you about a zebra that's going to kill you. Yeah. That's how you die, a zebra. <laughs> as you can imagine, this was a very slow process, but um, as you say, you know, it didn't. What the fuck else are you going to be doing back then? You're literally just trying to kill time till you die. Yeah, no phones, man. They're just living in the moment. Exactly, yeah, yeah. That, the moment sounds awful. <laughs> <laughs> <No>. <laughs> then in 1886, Ohio... When the planchette and these alphabet pointing devices collided, they made the talking board, the spirit board, now recognized as the Ouija board. And I just have this as note, the Ouija board is kind of like a catch-all name. Mm. Ouija is actually a brand, it's kind of like Jeep yep. or Coke. So Ouija board is a specific brand of spirit board, but we just call them all Ouija boards Yeah, so yeah. as a collective name. Mm. And this is really around the time where Ouija kind of embeds itself into American culture. So... During the 19th century, the United States was, it was really captivated by spiritualism. This spiritual practice really aligned well with Christian beliefs at the time and allowed individuals to partake in seances on a Saturday, Ooh. but then still attend church on a Sunday. Um. They kind of went hand in hand a little bit. It wasn't like it was today or like it is today. 
engaging in seances and automatic writing or table turning to connect with spirits, it was really, it was considered an acceptable and a really like virtuous endeavor. Yeah, it's really weird. It's like when I was in Salem and they were talking about how people back then who were like super religious pilgrims or whatever, but they would always do like white magic and stuff like yes. that. And it was like yeah. considered acceptable. It's like religion today is actually a lot more um, strict you only do what's in the Bible or whatever, yeah. you know, is in your religion and anything else is like devil worship kind yeah, of shit. Yeah. Like, you know, you don't mess with that. Yeah. But back then, like hundred years ago, they were like, oh, yeah. Magic was a huge part. Yeah, there was yeah. of all religions. Like, all religions, all the yeah. most, like which I know we're kind of specifically talking about Christianity, but like Ouija boards are like acceptable to like do. It wasn't like a taboo mm. for, for them back then or doing white magic. I suppose, well, like there was back then, there was a lot of stuff that... They couldn't, like, science couldn't explain at the time because mm -hmm. they, right. they weren't there yet. So, yeah. like, how does that work? Uh, magic. Yeah, you know? exactly. So yeah, it was, yeah. it was a catch-all. Yeah, know? good old magic. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking love magic. Yeah. <laughs> we should go back to saying that. My phone, how does it work? Magic. Ma ma yeah. ma magic, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> To be honest, still today, I think uh, the phone, I don't know how it works. Yeah, it's, it may as well be. Yeah. <laughs> you can explain to me. I won't care. Uh, it's magic. <laughs> So it's also, it's important as well to recognize that in the 19th century, in America as well, people had a very different relationship with death compared to our present day perspective. So death, it was really, it really was an integral part of daily life due to a very, like a lot shorter average lifespans. Mm. There was childbirth related fatalities, childhood illnesses, people were just desperate to connect with loved ones who'd gone away to fight in the American Civil War as well, who just never came home. Mm, that was a big, led to a huge rise in spiritualism and stuff huge, like that, especially yeah. in America. Yeah, and we'll see it a lot as well. We'll go on to talk about it a bit, but we'll see it a lot where these big uh, eras within America of like where thousands of people died, we'll see it like here in World War and uh, like the Great Depression and stuff. In these points in, in time in history, it really like Ouija board, like it spiked and spiritualism spiked. With mm. people. I know it seems like the, the harder things get, the more kind of people look for something else. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's even, that's I'd say that's exactly the very, very same today. Very true, very true. I know. Like podcasts. Yes, exactly. <laughs> We're here to save you. So in, uh, in 1886, the Associated Press, they covered uh, an emerging sensation in spiritualist communities of Ohio. Talking board. The motherfucking talking board. The talking board, man. The news spread widely, catching the attention of Charles Cannard uh, from Baltimore, Maryland. Following the American spirit of seizing opportunities and capitalizing on it, yep, Cannard, he took action. So in 1890, he assembled a team of four investors, marking the birth of the Cannard Novelty Company dedicated to the exclusive production and marketing of these innovative talking boards. Among the investors was Elijah Bond, a local lawyer, and Colonel Washington Bowie, a surveyor. While none of these men were particularly spiritual, uh, they didn't really believe in it, but they had a real shrewd business acumen and they had identified a unique market niche. What we're kind of saying earlier on, contrary to popular belief, Ouija does not actually derive from the French word uh, yes or we oui, and the American ya. Yeah. Instead, the German yeah. Oh, the German yeah. Sorry. But is that what people actually think that it's yes, yes? I, I think so. Yeah, it's, oh, it's one of those. Yeah, really? what's Ouija? Yeah, it's kind of somehow it's one of those things where people just believe it. Yeah, okay. It got it got out there. What someone we said call it. the spirit board. Yes, yes. Yes, oh, yes. Gosh. Yeah. That's, that's so. Yeah, that's a terrible. <laughs> that's a shitty name. Instead, the name was proposed by Helen Peters, the sister-in-law of one of the investors, Elijah Bond. Helen Peters, she had the gift of mediumship. During a session around the table, they inquired about the board's name, and it responded with Ouija. When they inquired about its meaning, the board cryptically replied, good luck. So the Ouija board actually named itself. Ah, uh, it named itself good luck. It named itself good. Uh, no, it, well... Wait, wait, did it mean good luck as... Good luck finding out, or, or yeah, yeah, or like what? It, well, they did ask what it means. And it I, I kind of <laughs> take it as, uh, do you know, like taken, you know, like when we leave these, oh, yeah, he's like, good yeah, luck, yeah, good luck, good yeah. luck. That's why I take it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's okay. why I hear it. Good luck. Yeah, I mean, because it doesn't. It's not good luck, really. Uh, from all the stories you're going to tell, it's like okay. it's kind of like good luck in opposite world. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this this Ouija board had some sarcasm. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Good luck. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> To secure a patent for the board, Elijah Bond and Helen Peters, they visited the patent office in Washington to submit their application. At the patent office, the chief patent officer uh, requested a demonstration mm. to make sure the board worked. If the board could accurately spell out his name, a name the founders were unaware of, then he would consider a patent for the application. So, gathering around the board, they engaged with the spirits. And astonishingly, the planchette spelled out the patent officer's name. 
The exact method remains Ooh. mysterious. Ooh. Although Elijah Bond's background as a patent attorney might have provided some insights into what his name was, I guess we'll never know. Uh, I don't think we're going to be able to figure this one out. No, no it was the Ouija board. It definitely <laughs> wasn't a, an attorney being able to find out a person's name pretty fucking easily. Know, right? Nope, we're not going to crack this case. What we do have certainty about is that on February 10th, 1891, a visibly shaken patent officer granted Bond a patent for his new toy or game. The initial patent, however, does lack an explanation for how the device actually functions. It merely just asserts its efficiency and just, yeah, it works. Okay, I don't it, know how. Just a, it's magic. It works. It's magic. Yeah. yeah. So embracing the ambiguity and mystery, uh, this was all part of a uh, marketing ploy. And let me tell you, it worked like a dream. So fast forward to 1892 and the Canard Novelty Company went from one factory in Baltimore to two in Baltimore. Two in New York, two in Chicago, wow. and one in London. They were cranking them out. Couldn't make them fast enough. It exploded, man. Wow. People couldn't get enough of it. So one year later, Canard and Bond, they were out um, They were out of the picture due to some internal drama. We're mm. not sure why. But a man named William Fold, a guy who had been there from the very start and who had been a stockholder and employee, he took over uh, and he was now steering the old, the old Ouija ship. Fold, interestingly, he actually died in a freak fall from a roof of his brand new factory in 1927. A factory he claimed that the Ouija board had suggested he construct. Spooky. But later on, what would happen was that the Fold family, who would kind of receive, I guess, the rights or ownership of the Ouija board making company, they actually would sell it, and it is Ouija boards are currently made by Hasbro. Mm, if you yes. can believe that. While they're making Transformers, they're also making haunted <laughs> death boards. <laughs> See, the Folds family, they sold the rights to these two guys uh, that called the Parker Brothers, Charles and George, I believe. So then they were the ones who were making and selling Ouija boards, and they took it to Ouija headquarters, which is located in none other than Salem, Massachusetts. Is it? It is. Interesting. Spooky city for a spooky game. In fact, today there's even a museum in Salem that's dedicated to uh, Ouija boards and uh, and the spirit boards. I said, we should go there. I know. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're going to be going to Salem soon. So yeah, uh, yeah we should go. We'll put on the old itinerary. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and so the Parker Brothers Company, though, they made the Ouija boards and they were eventually bought by Hasbro, who are the ones who sell Ouija boards today. As I said, a Ouija board is just, you can still buy spirit boards that are not made by Hasbro. Ouija mm. is just, they own, I guess, the rights to the term Ouija. So really, by this time, the Ouija board had really firmly embedded itself in American culture, becoming a smashing success in mm. the, kind of what I was speaking about earlier, in the 1910s and 20s, uh, the era was shaken by World War I and stirred by lively jazz, uh, the jazz age and prohibition, witnessed a skyrocketing trend in the Ouija's popularity. So during the Great Depression, the full company, they were doing quite well. They hustled to open up new factories. They were like struggling to keep up with the high demand of uh, these curious boards. As the years rolled on, peculiar and tantalizing Ouija stories became a regular feature in American newspapers also. In 1921, the New York Times unveiled a tale of a Chicago woman who, on her way to a psychiatric hospital, tried to convince doctors that her actions weren't driven by madness. Instead, she claimed that the Ouija spirits had advised her to leave her deceased mother's body in the living room for nah, about 15 days before laying her to rest in the backyard. Well, if the Ouija board told her to do it, I mean, come on. It wasn't me. Exactly. It was the Ouija board. Yes. <laughs> it's like, what are you going to fucking do? Arrest her? Arrest the fucking board. <laughs> <laughs> Idiots. So fast forward to 1930. Newspaper readers were captivated by accounts from Buffalo. Two women were accused of murdering another woman who they claimed only did so because the Ouija board told them to do so. And what the Ouija board says goes. So in 1930, Nancy Bowen found herself in a state of profound grief as a widow following the passing of her husband, Charlie Bowen. Nancy yearned for another opportunity to converse with her late husband. Who wouldn't, you know? Yeah. Where'd you put the car keys? You yeah, know, exactly. Just, yeah. Tell me the <laughs> obvious shit. Yeah, where's the money hidden, yeah. fucker? I was just to ask you. In her quest for connections, she turned to Lila Jimerson for assistance. Jimerson suggested the use of the Ouija board as a means to communicate with Charlie. Jesus, he's even dead and his fucking wife won't leave him alone. He's absolutely hounding him. Bitch wife, <laughs> still after him. He's like, Jesus, let me die in peace. No rest for the wicked. Yeah. The two women, they collaborated in an attempt to reach out to Charlie's spirit, who, to their astonishment, they succeeded in making contact with Charlie. Well, that was easy. And old Charlie's tale, it was a shocking one. Charlie's spirit indicated uh, he had been killed by an evil witch Ooh. named Clotilde Machant, Ooh. which is a French name, That's probably cool name. butchering that, but uh, the best I can do. 
So the revelation ignited a surge of anger within Nancy. It compelled her to confront at the alleged witch and, you know, seek answers. What are you doing? Why'd you do that? Okay. This all came to a head in March 1930 when Clotilde was discovered dead in her Buffalo, New York residence. The scene was grisly as she had been bludgeoned to death with a hammer. As is often the case uh, with these homicides, initial suspicion settled that it was, you know, it was the spouse. It was, it was her husband. Her husband, Clotilde's husband, yeah. okay. You had to have done it. So in this instance, Henry Machand, a, a notable French sculptor and Clotilde's husband, was under police scrutiny, despite his denials of any involvement. The subsequent investigation, however, into the homicide unraveled a bizarre tale that led to the arrest of Nancy. During the police interrogations, uh, Nancy made the astonishing claim that Clotilde was a witch who had murdered her husband. So according to Nancy's account, she and Lila Jimerson had used a Ouija board to communicate with Charlie Spirit. Here's the kicker though. (laughs) Nancy was illiterate. So she was unable to independently verify whether the Ouija board had indeed conveyed the information she sought. What did it say? I don't know. I don't know. You tell me. <laughs> yeah. It's so kind of a bad idea to use a Ouija board which spells out letters and you have no fucking idea what's going on. You know, like, what, see, what are, what are these symbols? Yeah, I can see it have been a problem, uh, but uh, okay. So she wholly relied on Lila Jimerson, who cunningly manipulated Nancy's superstitious beliefs to orchestrate a murder. Exploiting uh, Nancy's inability to read, Jimerson manipulated the planchette to spell out the words that falsely implicated uh, Clotilde Machand in Charlie B- Ooh, uh, Bone's death. Fucking Lila. Now, this actually all came down to a romantic rivalry between Henry Machand, uh, the renowned sculptor, who was known to be a bit of a womanizer, and Jimerson, Ooh. who was his bit of a side piece. Nice. Wow. What a guy. Right? Yeah, so she, she envisioned uh, that, you know, removing Clotilde from the equation would clear the path for her own relationship with uh, Henry. Both Nancy and Lila, they were apprehended and charged in connection with Clotilde's murder. Regrettably, though, the justice did not come for Clotilde. Uh, Jimerson, she was acquitted after undergoing two trials, while Nancy pleaded guilty to manslaughter, resulting in just a mere one-year sentence. So, not a lot there. Yeah, that's a crazy story, though, of using a... That's a really interesting one, using a Ouija board to manipulate a murder. That's, that's really right. cool. Yeah, that's smart. really interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now... For the longest time, the Ouija board resided on the outskirts of American culture, always intriguing, occasionally shrouded in mystery, and generally harmless, except for the previously mentioned Ouija-inspired crimes <laughs> and murders. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, but harmless, I don't know. But that all changed in 1973. Enter The Exorcist. Woo. Nice. This cinematic revelation featured the idea that a 12-year-old girl named Regan became possessed by a demon after a solo encounter with the Ouija board. Is there someone inside you? Sometimes. Who is it? It's Mike! Suddenly, the board took on a whole new sinister reputation. It was similar to the whole no one, you know, was afraid to go into the water until Jaws mentality. Now it's like, nobody really gave a shit about Ouija boards, and now it's like, do not mess around with a Ouija board. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Before The Exorcist, films and TV shows often depicted the Ouija board in a light-hearted, even silly manner. However, almost overnight, it transformed into the tool of the devil, becoming a favorite prop for horror creators. Beyond the screen, religious groups condemned the Ouija board as Satan's preferred means of communication. So, pop culture and media has definitely made us fear the Ouija board. Dare I say, yes I do dare say, because I just said it. There are lots of different ways to try and capture ghosts. We got um really shitty reality TV shows. Video recordings, sound recordings, those mm. e- EVP, me, oh, what are yeah. they called? The things, the, or the thing that finds orbs or something. Oh, yeah, it's just I, dust. I, I love orbs. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's like, <gasps> oh, it's ghost. No, it's, it's, it's dust. No, it's just dust. It's, if, and if that's a ghost, then that's like the shittest ghost I've ever seen. This is <laughs> awful. But these are all electronic. And put some distance between you and these specters, I guess it's some sort of comfort. You can walk away at any time to put down the device, the infrared cameras, or just turn it off and you're fine. However, the Ouija board is like an analog version. Essentially, I mean, it's just wood with letters on it, so there's nothing special about it. The key is it needs you. Yeah, you listening. Which is why I think it is so haunting. You are the vessel that spirits come true now. You are the communication device, not some piece of camera or recording equipment. You are the equipment. So let's talk about some more people made vessels to do the work of El Diablo. In 2001, in Minco City, Oklahoma, 53-year-old Carol Sue Elvaker, her daughter Tammy, and Tammy's two lively daughters took out the L Ouija board and sat down for a bit of a spook session. As you do. As you do. Sure, a bit of crack, you know. Things, Things though took a dark turn. 
Indeed, they did. When a message came true for Carol that Tammy's husband, Brian, he was evil. Not just evil, he needs to go. Carol was like, well, okay, fair enough. Then. She just, <laughs> Say no more. Yeah, all right. I'm the problem solver. I'll sort of say. <laughs> she got up and she stabbed Brian, evil Brian, in his sleep and then proceeded to turn the knife on one of her granddaughters, who she also suspected of being evil. But thankfully, she was unsuccessful at getting her. As Brian bled to death, Tammy, who was Carol's daughter, managed to take the knife away from Carol and hid it in the house. Carol left the house with her two kids, one yep. who was trying to be killed, yep. her mother, who yep. was the killer, and then left her husband, Brian, to just bleed Believe out yeah. in the bed. Oh, fair? This is one of these things. I, I, I read it a couple of times. Like, did I get that right? And yeah. I'm like, no, no, yeah, she, she went in the car with him. Well, yeah. in fairness, now it was the Ouija board's that's, fault. That's so, true, yeah. I mean, eventually if you took the Ouija board with her, it's like, <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Grandmother Carol drove the Ford Northeast towards Tulsa on Interstate 44. She eventually crashed the car into a road sign in an attempt to kill all... She's going off script now at this point. The Ouija board didn't say to do this. No, no, she didn't. She's like, all right. I'm taking the initiative. Yeah, exactly. I I know it will tell me eventually, so better go do it. Carol suffered two broken ankles in the wreck. The others were only injured slightly. After getting out of the car, Carol tried tried again, unsuccessfully, to attack one of Tammy's daughters by pushing the 15-year-old daughter into traffic. She was just, she was determined. She Once she starts, she follows it through. If, I'll give her that. That's it. If she, nothing, she's determined. Yeah. yeah, she's a stubborn woman. Despite her injuries, Carol ran from the scene. With her two bronco ankles. <laughs> she ran from the scene. She then took off all her clothes, jumped over the highway barrier, and ran into a wooded area north of the interstation. <laughs> and police later found her hiding, completely bollocks naked. <laughs> Uh, Carol, you good? Yeah. <laughs> Are we okay, Carol? Are we okay here? <laughs> what did the Ouija board tell you to do this too? Tammy was also later arrested on a complaint of being an accessory to murder. See, the assistant district attorney said Brian Roach, the husband who was stabbed as he slept, begged for help, but was let bleed to death. Tammy didn't try and save her husband. Tammy Roach also hid the knife, supplied the getaway vehicle, and didn't try to get away from Carol when she had the chance. However, because Carol was found not guilty by reason of insanity, Prosecutors ended up dropping the accessory charge against Tammy, as the charge would not have stood after Carol was ruled not guilty. System works, huh? Nah, I know. Works like a charm. <laughs> Tammy did end up pleading guilty to the child abuse charge and was sentenced to a year in the Grady County Jail, and Carol was institutionalized. This was a big case that shocked the city of Minko at the time. The victim, Brian Roach, had actually served as mayor for the city from 1986 to 91, so he was well known and respected in the area. He was only 19 years old at the time, and he ended up being killed by, I mean, frankly, he was killed by the Ouija board, if you ask me. And so here's another story of a weird Ouija board encounter, and this is from the UK, County Durham, uh, on Christmas Eve 2014. See, a guy named Paul Carroll and his wife Margaret were using a Ouija board on Christmas Eve. Christmas classic. It's oh, up yeah. there with, you know, Vacation and Die Hard and all the, all the classics. They might have been watching Nightmare Before Christmas, got a bit confused. Mm, yeah, we're like, well, let's have our own Nightmare Before Christmas. Mm. While he was uh, attempting to contact the dead, apparently, this is what he says, and frankly, it sounds pretty true. A bad spirit popped out of the Ouija board and entered their dog. Okay. Molly, a Bedlington Terrier. So, there's only only one thing which can be done at this point. You gotta kill the goddamn thing. (laughs) So, Paul drowned the dog, and then chopped it up and threw its remains down the drain. Holy shit. This was later discovered when Paul, he had a drain blockage. He's like, cops not working, I'm getting getting floods here, all this stuff. So he called the company to unblock the drain, and then so a poor plumber had to arrive, was snaking through the drains, and came face to face with the remains of Fido. Paul was then arrested and he was charged with cruelty to animals, but there's more. So he pleaded guilty and he received a suspended sentence. Then, in January 2015, so about a month after the Christmas Eve spooktacular, Margaret, Paul's wife, and their daughter Katrina, and by the way, check out their, their faces, because they have faces like a slapped arse compared right. them. Yeah. The two of them then used the Ouija board, his wife and his daughter. Who knows what exactly happened when they're using the Ouija board, they, but they, apparently they like to dabble in the dark arts, it appears. And shortly after this Ouija session, they both attempted to kill themselves by taking a buttload of pills and then setting their own house on fire while they were inside of it. <laughs> now, I can only imagine, though, it seems like they had one of those, mm, kind of regretting doing that now, Ooh, yeah, can I have a yeah. take back on that one? Because then they made themselves get sick and they called a fire department and the house was put out. They were hospitalized but recovered and both got four years inside. Allegedly, the Ouija board made them do it. 
Now here's another story, and this is actually quite a spooky story. I came across this while I was perusing Reddit, you know, where all the all good research is done on oh, people God. telling yeah. bullshit stories on Reddit. But this is one, right? And here's one from a user named uh, Leon Crotchman, which is a good ass name. And it goes a little something like this. Leon Crotchman, if you're hearing this, I am reading out your story. So <laughs> hope you don't mind. But this is a re- I read this and I was like, man, this is a crazy story. So I'll just read it out as, as it was written on uh, on Reddit. Uh, my buddy Roger had a basement. Right, and at the foot of the basement stairs was a door. This door, at the bottom of the stairs, it closed off the basement pool and darts room from the rest of the house. The only problem is that after so many years, the door swelled up and would no longer close. Trying to close the door to the basement was a task. Uh, it had swelled up so much that the flooring had been gouged out from the door scraping so hard when they would try and close it, it just would mm. not close. Now here's the creepy part. Roger. Myself and two other friends were playing around with the Ouija board in the dark. After about 15 minutes of goofing off, Roger's mother called him up for dinner. He didn't go. So more shenanigans ensued for about 5-10 more minutes, and Roger's mother then started to get mad. They could hear her stomping across the house just above them. Above them, they were in the basement, so on, on on the ground floor. And then she went to the stairwell and she screamed, Roger, get your ass up here for dinner right now! Roger responded, Okay, give me two more minutes. The mother then responded, Don't just stand there at the foot of the stairs, get up here. Now the problem was that they were roughly 15 to 20 feet from the door. There was no way she would have been able to see Roger. Roger then said, We're sitting at the bar. And the moment the word bar left his mouth, the door that nobody could close slammed shut. The four of them then immediately went from joking around to screaming and panicking as they couldn't open it and they were locked in the basement. His dad eventually had to jump down through the basement window well and had to kick the door open. He never went back to Roger's house. It's a good story. I mean, it's probably bullshit. That was good, But it's a good story. Chills. Chills. You know, know, that's what... Just mom. He's got chills. 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 I have got chills. (laughs) You know, well, that's... uh, You know, it's a good story. Who knows if it's true or not. It's probably not. But, you know, I always say, if you can choose between the truth or the legend, hey. I'm going to tell you a good story. Never let the truth get in the way of a good story. Exactly. And here's another good oh, story. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, this is a good one. Because, um, well, you'll get to it. But we, me and Keith, we, we like to watch spooky movies together. Mm-hmm. We and did. recently mm-hmm. we watched a story or the movie called Veronica. We did. Um, and it's a Spanish movie. Mm. And it's still very good though. Very, yeah. Mm. I know. Well, like, mm. I like you automatically just docking your points because it's Spanish. I'm not, I'm not. I'm not one <laughs> yeah. for like. It's still good. I don't <laughs> want to read when I'm watching. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I'm like, come on, Jesus. Here, do we have to go through this again? But it, like, as far like, I'm not a big fan of uh, subtitled movies or uh, even worse, dubbed movies. Like, mm. When the lips don't. Oh, something. dubbed, uh, dubbed is worse. Oh. I can't watch a dubbed yeah. movie. I definitely can't watch that. I can sort of get by with with subtitles, but You'll not a huge fan. Of it, but yeah, this was particularly good. I really enjoyed it. So, yeah, it was good movies. Even if you're like subtitles, give give it a go. Yeah. It. it's good this is where we i guess we get into the real meat and potatoes of today yeah 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 this is the main story this is actually the reason it was when after we watched the movie it was when we were like oh we should do an episode on ouija boards yes. and do this story yeah. this case in particular so it uh, stands out as the most renowned instances uh, for enthusiasts of this supernatural in spain and it's etched into history for being the first case of paranormal we documented in an unofficial police report mm, it's legit so it, the story is actually about uh, a girl called Est, uh, Estef- Estefania. 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 Yeah. Est- uh, you can tell we were so... I think, Estefania. Three years of Est- Spanish over Est- here. Est- Estefania. Okay. Okay. Oh, here we go. Okay. I guess so before we get into it, yeah, I'm going to mess up the names. I apologize. I did Google them beforehand. I tried that whole pronounce.com Right. Thing. Yeah, I, yeah. I gave it a go. I'm going to do my best. I apologize for getting them wrong. I am sorry. So... Born in 1973, Estefania Guiteres Lazaro was a third child among six siblings. Her parents, Concepcion Lazaro and Maximo Guiteres, resided with the family in Vallecas, located in the southern part of Madrid, Spain. Estefania was, she was an ordinary teen, teenage girl. She was cherished by her siblings. In subsequent interviews, two of her brothers, they fondly depicted her as a fantastic and nurturing sister who uh, really radiated warmth and smiles and was very much a mother-like figure. So today, we'll begin our story on November 19th, 1992, between the hours of 2 and 3 a.m. in the early morning. In Vallecas, Madrid, the local police received a call from an individual residing in the Vallecas area, which was a, it was a working class area, it was a working class community on the outskirts of Madrid. So, without delay, 
Two patrol cars they dispatched to this specific address, apartment number eight on Luis Maron Street. The apartment was situated uh, within a 12-story residential building. So the responding officers, they anticipated really just a routine call. A uh, run-of-the-mill, similar to the other ones they typically receive at uh, this time of night, you know, like rowdy teenagers or family disputes. However, upon arrival, they were greeted by an entire family, parents and children alike, gathered on the street, too frightened to re-enter the residence. Startled awake in the middle of the night, they reported hearing eerie noises, unsettling bangs, and glimpses of shadowy figures within their apartment. Gripped by fear, Ooh. they chose the chilly street over the comforting whatever presence seemed to inhabit their home. Inspector Jose Pedro Negri, he beckoned three fellow officers to accompany him inside and entered the residence alongside with the family's father, Maximo. Upon stepping inside, unsettling events transpired. So chilling that even the seasoned police officers, they were shaken to their core. Now, this might start to sound a bit like a scene from a movie. However, these accounts, they're not just mere anecdotes. They're documented in official police reports penned by Inspector Jose himself. It's important to mention as well that the reports, they do follow the standard format of a police report. It does refrain from mentioning anything about anything unusual like uh, ghosts or ghouls. Uh, instead, it just offers a straightforward observations of what happened at night. So in the report, it details an occurrence where the wardrobe do door swung open with force, narrowly missing the faces of the officers, despite having been locked moments earlier. It mentions the presence of loud noises coming from the balcony, which, upon inspection, revealed nothing unusual. There was nothing out there. It was an odd brown slime that had materialized on the bedside table. Additionally, the report uh, recounts an incident involving a crucifix. Initially hung up on the wall when arrival, it was later discovered in the middle of the floor. The crucifix had been torn from its wood mount and three crawl-like scratches were visibly etched on the mm. wall where it was fixed as though it had been forcibly removed. The agents, they also ventured into the bathroom, deemed by the family as the most haunted spot in the whole house. Here, they experienced an abrupt and unprecedented drop in temperature. Such an, like an unconventional entry in official police report, it really erased a couple of eyebrows. Uh, people were a bit sceptical, like, nah, really? So it was subjected to like a thorough analysis and examination. However, the police inspector, Jose, he's always remained resolute in his account. In various interviews and televised discussions, he's stuck to his story and he's Brilliant. upheld the consistency of the narrative over the years. He hasn't wavered, he hasn't changed. He yeah. said, this is what happened, it's in the report, you can read it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This happened. Okay, yeah, it's a, it's a really, really wild, uh, wild story. Let me just get into it now. So to understand the unsettling scenes that had just unfolded when the police arrived, we need to rewind a little bit to over two and a half years, to March of 1990. It all began as an ordinary day. 16-year-old Estefania Gutierrez Lazaro set off for school. She only lived a few minutes from her school and she took her normal, everyday route. When midday arrived, Estefania found herself with a free period due to a teacher's absence. Seizing the opportunity, herself and two of her friends opted for what girls usually do in their free time, I assume, and decided to <laughs> hang out in the bathroom. <laughs> One of Estefania's friends had recently lost her boyfriend in a tragic motorbike accident and wanted to attempt contacting uh, him, so she proposed using the old Ouija board to pass the time. Now, this wasn't entirely out of the ordinary for these girls. It wasn't their first encounter with the occult practice of Ouija. However, there were never any sinister undertones or actions. It was always just, you know, they were having a bit of a laugh, harmless fun, just, you know, having a few beers, Ouija board, a bit of a laugh, you know, girls, get together, being girls. girls being girls. The girls assumed their regular positions, forming a circle around the Ouija board. They placed their index fingers on a glass that served as a makeshift planchette, and they delved into their concentration and uttered, Hola! Uh, I'm guessing, you know, Come, come, come te amo! <laughs> uh, you know, Buenos dias, That's ghost! Like the limit of our Spanish. But what we can confirm is that their session was abruptly interrupted by the unexpected appearance of one of their teachers. Bursting into the bathroom, the teacher grabbed the Ouija board, snapped it in half, and scolded them to get them back to class. Something unusual happened, though. The glass they were using as a planchette started to fill with a white smoke and then exploded into a thousand pieces as if it was under too much pressure. Both the teacher and Estefania's friends then observed the smoke make its way over to Estefania, who unwillingly inhaled it. In the weeks that followed, Estefania underwent a rapid transformation in her demeanor. Her interactions with her family took a sharp downturn, reaching a point where she attempted physical altercations with her siblings and parents on multiple occasions. Signs of mental instability started emerging as she struggled with insomnia and experienced visual and auditory hallucinations. 
encountering dark figures that seemed to whisper unsettling things to her. Her mother recounted moments when Estefania would lapse into catatonic states lasting 15 to 20 minutes, followed by fits of uncontrollable laughter. And if that wasn't enough, she began to suffer from seizures that, over time, grew more frequent and increasingly tense. Now, Estefania's parents, uh, they didn't dismiss her struggles as a passing phase. They consulted various experts, you know, as you can imagine, in an attempt to help their daughter, going to doctors and so forth. But none of the medical professionals could pinpoint what was happening to her. They couldn't pinpoint what the root cause of her affliction was. At one point, she received, like, for example, a diagnosis of epilepsy, even though her symptoms appeared atypical. Despite undergoing treatment for epilepsy, no conclusive improvements were observed. Now, tragically, Estefania passed away on July 14, 1991. After experiencing a severe seizure a few days prior, she slipped into a coma on the evening of July 13, while at her home. At around 11 p.m., she was transported to a hospital in Madrid, where she ultimately succumbed three hours later at 2 a.m. The witching hour. The cause of her untimely death uh, was attributed to pulmonary asphyxia brought about by a convulsion. Now, there was a brief period where Estefania's family was left to try and grapple with the grief and heartache of losing a dearly beloved daughter, dearly beloved sister. But it wasn't long before strange poltergeisty activity started happening in their apartment. It started out with little things such as doors opening, closing, small objects moving, falling off tables. Estefania's mother, Concepcion, also said that she heard a voice calling Mom from the bathroom. The room they would later say was the most haunted, mm. and it certainly is after I'm done with it. <laughs> it wasn't long before the situation escalated into a more violent nature. Family members recounted witnessing the silhouette of an elderly figure traversing the apartment's hallway. Crucifixes seemed to invert themselves, and doors began to slam shut with greater force. The family had tried hiring mediums and paranormal investigators, but unfortunately they were only met with charlatans. This all came to a head in the month of November 1992. Throughout the month, unsettling occurrences unfolded. Children claimed to be pushed by an unseen force. The mother reported sensations of something touching her feet during the night. Violent banging and noise emanated from the walls. And on one occasion, a glass was hurled in the direction of a child's head. In a particularly alarming incident, the family dog was fucked several <laughs> meters across the room. What is it with the dogs? <laughs> I know. This, like, multiple got, dogs are well, getting injured in the this story. Tape. Yeah, man. Poor dogs. <laughs> Ouija hates dogs. Yeah. You hear it up here first. Despite moving their mattresses to the living room for shared sleeping, the disturbances only got worse. On November 19th, 1992, the family reached a breaking point. Faced with the unrelenting turmoil, they resolved to seek professional assistance. With that, this brings us back to the beginning of the story, the moment when Maximo Gutierrez contacted the local police regarding a disturbance at apartment number 8 on Luis Marin Street. The family eventually decided to sell the house, but the sale occurred in 1998, six years following the incident involving the police. The decision to sell wasn't driven by the haunting, as the paranormal phenomena gradually subsided and then ceased entirely by 1996. Interestingly, the subsequent owners never encountered any instances of paranormal activity during their time in the house. But there was also instances of uh, a photo of Estefania bursting into flames. That's as true. Well. Yeah, that's true. It was like it was burnt within the frame, sort of. Yeah, the really photo creepy. itself had burned, but the the glass yeah. or the frame itself wasn't burnt. It yeah, was literally yeah. the photo itself. Very, very creepy. Yeah. So what actually happened, though? Uh, well, Estefania was on her way to being diagnosed with epilepsy, and her mother also suffered from the same disease, so it was likely hereditary. But the autopsy didn't reveal anything strange at all. The family all witnessed a strange and violent paranormal activity in the house. However, some experts believe this could be a result of mass hysteria. They all did go through the devastating and tragic loss of their sister and daughter, so emotions were high. Or it could have been stuff like um, carbon monoxide poisoning yeah. or mold, something like yeah, that, yeah. causing them to hallucinate and feel weird, causing them to mm. be weird. See things in. However, one of the brothers later revealed, uh, years later, that the noise heard by the police on the balcony was just him throwing a stone. He said he did so because his mother feared the officers may not be taking them seriously and so asked them to do it, which is I always can... the best idea. It's not a good idea, but yeah. I, I can kind of see where she's coming from, where when you're saying there's something in the house and then they're coming over, there's nothing there. So yeah. You have to make them believe yeah. you know, there is something yeah. here. So I kind of get where she's coming from, but yeah, not, not a great idea. And so in the end, uh, we will never know exactly what happened. And it just all comes down to whether or not you, dear listener, feel safe playing a game of Ouija. 
super super interesting like I there is scientific explanation to Ouija as well what the L nerds say, yeah you know, the L scientists so like the action of the board um, they say it can be easily explained by unconscious movements so it's like it's this phenomenon uh, known as ideometer effect okay so but you can do it to yourself so if you oh shoot after this actually it's mm. good I tried it already it does work uh, so if you get a small weight like a ring uh, just on a piece of string uh, ideally the string has to be about a foot long Hold it, uh, hold the end of the string with your arm and put it in front of you so the weight hangs down freely and try to keep it as still as possible. Hold your arm completely still as well and if you just start thinking, with, so without moving your arm at all, okay, just start thinking clockwise or anti-clockwise, whatever you want, yeah. you'll notice that the weight will start to circle in that direction. Mm. So I tried it myself okay. and I swear to God, like, I'm so sure my hand was still and I was thinking clockwise, clockwise and it starts moving clockwise and then I start thinking Anticlockwise, anticlockwise. Really? And it, it stopped, swayed a little bit, and then went back the other way again. Wow. That's so weird. This, it is weird, but it, like, it, it all happens to these uh, tiny micro-movements. Okay. So you're making them without even realizing. Mm-hmm. Or is there a force working through you Ooh, to make these movements? Maybe. Oh, we'll maybe. never know. We'll never know. Maybe we'll never know. Yeah, man, that's crazy. That's it. Yeah, who knows uh, anything about it? Uh, I don't know. Uh, but like I said at the top, it's probably not something I really want to kind of faff about with and mess around. It's not something I'm too keen on, uh, you know, kind of delving into and getting involved with. It's just, eh, not for yeah. me. Just, yeah, leave it. Yeah. Yeah. Le- le- leave it be. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, speaking of Ouija and ghosts and demons, before we finish off, Keith, have you got any more ghost stories from your haunted house that you live in? It's actually been pretty quiet. Really? Surprisingly. Uh, well. And you know what? This would have been the week for like... I don't know, whatever's there in the house to kind of... Because we've been putting up our Halloween decorations ah, and shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wants to join a party. Wants to join a party, exactly. And I was fully expecting, because we have all these... We got a we, we got a bunch of stuff secondhand. There was just someone selling them. This huge box of Halloween decorations. Yeah. A lot of the decorations are these things, you know, when you walk by, it makes them like... Yeah, I love those. They're really cheap shit. Yeah, yeah, they're yeah. great. So, like, this is definitely going to go off in the middle of the night and scare the yeah. shit out of me. But so far, no, like, nothing. This would be the perfect time for the ghost to come in and be like, I'm going to set all it off at the same time at 3 a.m. in the morning. Yeah. But so far, nothing has happened, which is kind of nice, you know, a bit of yeah. rest. Maybe, maybe he's taking a break. Maybe he's on holidays. Yeah, exactly. You know? He's limbering up. He's getting yeah. ready. You know, well, if you really want to make a change. getting ready for spooky season. Exactly. That's yeah, it. yeah. Well, if you want to make a change, how about you use a Ouija board in your house and see what happens? Ooh. Mm. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not um, doing that. <laughs> right. Here, listen, uh, everybody. Thank you so much for listening uh, to the That Chapter Podcast. I hope you enjoyed this whole episode uh, with Keith. The next episode will be out sometime next week. So check it out. But um, yeah. All right. Here, listen. I think that wraps up this one. So thanks again. And any final words, Keith? Uh, yeah, don't mess around with a Ouija board. Yeah. I guess. Yeah. I, Play safe. That's fair. Uh, all right. Thanks, guys, and take care of yourselves. Bye. See ya. <laughs>